Hey hey, Marcus House with you here and today we are going to talk about the potential downsides of the proposed SpaceX Starlink network. SpaceX has only a few weeks ago launched its first set of 60 Starlink communication satellites, which was the first of a total proposed 12,000 satellites to be launched in upcoming years. The satellite constellation aims to create and provide a super low latency global telecommunications network. Better yet, we could start to see this rollout in a meaningful way soon with Starlink targeted to offer these new broadband services in the northern United States and Canadian latitudes after only six launches. This will then rapidly expand to global coverage of the populated world after around 24 launches or so. So SpaceX is currently targeting up to six Starlink launches by the end of this year, so we should start to see real world usage of this network by 2020. Hopefully this accounts for a little Elon time here as we all know he tends to be, let's say, optimistic. But uh, obviously I believe that we as a human race have the potential here to create a global network accessible by almost anyone with the appropriate equipment on hand. Being connected to the internet is something that I think most of us take for granted. I certainly do at times. I sit here on my fiber connection really thinking about the majority of the world that do not have this form of access. I mean, just think about this for a minute. Imagine being completely disconnected from what is arguably one of the greatest creations that humans have ever created. As, as far as I'm concerned, access to the internet has now become a basic human right. This ability to connect us all is amazing and it provides us with the ability to communicate and share information and stories with the world. So if we could provide easily affordable education to everyone, no matter what country, if we as a species could connect and help billions of people in remote locations inexpensively access the internet, it's an amazing thing. Now, I've seen a lot of negative comments about the potential downsides. We've seen um, arguments regarding light pollution, uh, the Kessler effect, uh, fear of Big Brother, but on the flip side, I see a lot more benefits. Elon Musk responded to a number of tweets with people worried about light pollution and the response from Elon was clear. He said that potentially helping billions of economically disadvantaged people is the greater good. That said, we'll make sure Starlink has no material effect on discoveries in astronomy. We care a great deal about science. I quite enjoyed the debate with Dylan O'Donnell's video here linked in the top right where he explains the backlash regarding SpaceX's recent Starlink network launch from the perspective of the astronomy community. Now these are all valid concerns and we're looking forward to seeing how all this plays out after this initial 60 satellites are all running at the correct altitudes with their solar arrays aligned as intended. The other very heated topic that this video is now going to cover was in relation to space debris and the associated Kessler effect that could be caused by adding such extensive networks around the Earth. Now, for those of you that may not be familiar with the term, the Kessler effect or Kessler syndrome was proposed by the NASA scientist Donald J. Kessler back in 1978 and it is essentially a scenario where two colliding objects in low Earth orbit generate more debris which then collides with other objects creating even more debris until the entirety of low Earth orbit is an impassable array of junk. This could in essence render space activities and the use of satellites in specific orbital ranges difficult for many generations. So of course this is a very valid concern and one that I think deserves this topic of its own. Now I'm not so worried by the Starlink network by itself, but let's just remember that there are several other proposed networks similar to this, including Blue Origin planning to launch more than 3,000 satellites at a similar low altitude, um, then there's OneWeb, and also I believe Facebook are wanting to do the same sort of thing. Keep in mind of course, the United States are not going to be the only country that want to do this. Do you think that other countries are going to sit by and let these few tech companies have all the fun? No way. They are going to want control of their own satellite constellations as well. So what does all this mean? How can we control this technology without it getting out of hand? I think there may indeed need to be some very strict global rules that need to be put into place so we as humans don't cause some kind of debris cascade around the Earth. 
Now this is where altitude for the network is really important. The lower the satellites are placed in orbit, the less time needs to pass before they will naturally slow down due to atmospheric drag. A lot of people assume that once a craft is in space, there is no atmosphere, and to a certain extent, if you are high enough, this is pretty much true. But there is no magic altitude where you instantly leave the atmosphere completely. It's essentially a gradient that reaches quite far up in altitude over the Earth's surface. In a low Earth orbit, some atmosphere is still present. It is a very small amount, but there are still atmospheric particles continually bombarding anything that is orbiting low around the Earth. The International Space Station, as an example, orbits at an altitude around 400 kilometers or 253 miles. A tiny amount of atmospheric drag causes it to slow down continually, and this lowers its altitude by around 2 kilometers every month. Now, the lower it gets, the more drag occurs. So, to compensate for this, the space station will regularly boost its orbit using thrusters by a visiting spacecraft or by using propulsion of its own. Starlink's initial shell of satellites will orbit at 550 kilometers, higher than the space station by around 150 kilometers or so. There is still, however, some atmospheric drag here as well. Each Starlink satellite is equipped with efficient ion thrusters powered by Krypton, which just happens to be the first spacecraft using this type of propellant. And this is going to allow each of them to raise their orbit, maneuver in space, and then also deorbit that satellite at the end of its useful life. Now, SpaceX claims that these satellites not only meet, but exceed all regulatory and industry standards. Now, this is all well and good, you might say, but what if these things break down and can't deorbit? Now, although this may be quite unlikely, especially in later iterations of the satellites, there are bound to be some of the 12,000 satellites that malfunction or get hit by something. Even in this worst case scenario, they are orbiting at an altitude that is low enough that atmospheric drag will naturally slow the satellites until they burn up in the Earth's atmosphere, and this will happen within only five years or so. Now, if we compare this to other higher orbits, it can take hundreds or thousands of years to do the same. A geostationary orbit is much further out, around the 35,700 kilometer mark. Now, this type of orbit is very useful because the time it takes to do one complete orbit of the Earth is exactly one day. So, for any observer on the ground, the satellite appears fixed in the sky. The problem is, is that they are so very far away out here, and the time it takes a signal to travel back and forth at the speed of light is quite high. It takes around a quarter of a second for a trip from one ground station to the satellite and back to another ground station. So, for a round trip for two-way communication, this is close to half a second from one Earth station uh, to another and then back again to the first. So, it's a long time by today's standards. The other problem with geostationary satellites way up here is that they are a very, very long way from any atmospheric drag. These satellites are basically going to sit up here forever by human standards, so what they've tried to do over the years is just slightly raise the orbits of old satellites to what they call a graveyard orbit. This way, they will not be getting in the way of any other new satellites being placed into that very precise geostationary orbit. So all these vessels being pushed into these graveyard orbits are simply going to continue accumulating until we stop putting them there or spending a huge amount of resources trying to remove them. Um, at this altitude, it's extremely energy intensive to either deorbit them or even pushing them way out into an orbit around the sun. Now, SpaceX's target altitude of 550 kilometers for this initial phase places the satellites above the International Space Station, but well below the Iridium satellites, which sit up above 750 kilometers in altitude. Now, this allows the Starlink satellites to be quickly disposed of, even if some of them do lose control and essentially become space debris. So it does seem that the lower SpaceX can make the Starlink network, the less it will contribute to any long-term debris problem. This is all really good news. Another factor to keep in mind is the artificial intelligence controlling the satellites themselves. 
On the Starlink website, it is stated that the satellites utilize inputs from the Department of Defense's debris tracking system to autonomously perform maneuvers to avoid collisions with space debris and other spacecraft. This capability reduces human error, allowing for a more reliable approach to collision avoidance. Now, before people start spamming the comment thread here about potentials of Skynet, this does not mean that there is some sentient artificial intelligence in the network that's going to decide to turn on all humans. These programs in their nature are actually relatively simple. They crunch a lot of data to detect any potential collision event, and then they just automatically adjust the vessel's trajectory to mitigate that event. Of course, this doesn't mean that all objects are accurately tracked, or even that all objects are catalogued in the system. In rare cases, there may be a collision. It's happened before, and it, look, it's going to happen again. All we can do is try to mitigate these events as much as possible. Another thing to try and keep in mind is that the distances we are talking about here are really, really massive. The surface area of the Earth, as an example, is roughly 510 million square kilometers. So let's, as an exercise, just randomly divide this area by 12,000 satellites. If we evenly spaced all 12,000 across the entire planet's surface, that would mean each satellite is allocated roughly 42,500 square kilometers. That is a huge amount of space, but now let's expand the surface area of the Earth an extra 550 kilometers to match Starlink's target altitude. The surface area of this sphere is now around 600 million square kilometers, and this gives each satellite over 50,000 square kilometers. But wait, this is space. Each satellite will vary in altitude, allowing them to pass above or below each other with kilometers of distance in between. The sheer volume of space we are talking about here is amazingly high, and it would be very unlikely for a collision to occur. As Elon Musk recently stated, we don't want to trivialize space junk or to not take it seriously, but it's not crowded up there, it's extremely sparse. If your goal was to try and hit something, it wouldn't be easy. And likewise, I believe space debris is an important issue to address, and with any endeavor, there may be the odd issue we face. And let's not forget that it's not so much the planned objects we need to think about, it's the crazy unplanned events that can occur, such as anti-satellite missile tests that have occurred over the last few decades. So overall, I think SpaceX have a great sounding plan for the network that will mitigate the majority of the risks. So I'm excited to see how all of this rolls out. The first 60 satellites are apparently doing very well. They've all generated positive power and communicated with ground stations. And SpaceX continues to monitor the constellation for any satellite that isn't performing correctly. And we've heard rumors that there are several of the satellites not working 100%. But we're going to find out more about that soon, I'm sure. Again though, very best of luck in the future Starlink launch of SpaceX. We're all watching this play out. So I hope you enjoyed that video. Thank you for watching. Please do take a second and hit that like button. All of your support is just amazing. If you're new to my channel and have enjoyed this content, please do consider subscribing. It really does help me out. If you have any comments or questions, please pop them down in the comments as well. As always, a massive thank you to my very awesome quality control squad shown here. I couldn't do it without you. If you're interested in these topics and would like to help out, follow my Discord link in the description and let's chat. In the tile in the bottom left today, we have my Starlink video from the other week. In the top right is my latest video, and in the bottom right, a video that YouTube has selected from my channel just for you. Thanks again for watching, and we'll see you all in the next video.